Now I'm going to provide a quick overview of some common ERP components to give you an idea of some of the general topics that can be studied with ERPs. We'll start with sensory components and then move on to later components that reflect higher level cognitive and affective processes. I've already shown you this artificial ERP waveform to convey the general idea that the sequence of voltages over time reflects the sequence of processes that are triggered by a stimulus. Now we're going to dive a little deeper into visual sensory responses. We've already talked a little about the C1 wave, which comes from primary visual cortex and can be either positive or negative depending on whether the stimulus is in the lower or upper visual field. When it's positive, it merges together with the P1, so you don't usually see a distinct C1 unless the stimulus is in the upper visual field and the C1 is negative. The P1 and N1 waves reflect the combination of many different brain areas, most of which are in higher level areas of visual cortex. As you might expect for electrophysiological signatures of sensory processing, the C1, P1, and N1 waves are highly sensitive to the physical properties of the stimulus, such as brightness. And as discussed in another video, the N1 or N170 wave is bigger for faces than for most other classes of stimuli. Experience also plays a role. For example, words elicit a large N1 in experienced readers. After decades of ERP research, I bet I have a huge N1 when I look at ERP waveforms. The P1 and N1 are larger for attended location stimuli than for ignored location stimuli. However, these effects are typically observed only for spatial attention, and only when attention has shifted prior to stimulus onset. Other kinds of attention don't usually have an impact until later components. For example, we see a component called N2PC if attention shifts to a location after stimulus onset. Auditory stimuli generate a very different pattern of sensory ERP responses. Whereas the first visual ERPs start around 50 milliseconds, you can see auditory ERPs within about a millisecond. The auditory system is way faster than the visual system. The initial auditory ERPs come from the brainstem and are called the auditory brainstem responses, or ABRs. They're the one common exception to the rule that ERPs are ordinarily generated by cortical pyramidal cells. Note that the ABRs are labeled with Roman numerals. They're used to diagnose hearing impairments in clinical audiology, and they're often measured in newborn infants to screen for hearing problems. Both of my kids were screened in the hospital shortly after they were born. I really got a kick out of that. If we look on a longer time scale and use different filter settings, we can see the mid-latency auditory responses, which are generated in the medial geniculate nucleus and the primary auditory cortex. On an even longer time scale, we can see what are called the long latency auditory responses, which come from a variety of cortical areas. Another interesting auditory component is the mismatch negativity. We see this component if we use an auditory oddball paradigm. For example, we might present a tone every 500 milliseconds, with 80% being 1000 Hz standard tones, and the other 20% being 1500 Hz deviant tones. It sounds like this. This would keep going for several minutes. The deviant tones elicit a larger negative response than the standards around 200 milliseconds. This is called the mismatch negativity, or MMN. You can get an MMN with virtually any type of physical deviance that someone can perceive. The data shown here are from the ERP core MMN task, where we used intensity deviance. The MMN doesn't require that the subject's performing a task. It's an automatic response to the mismatch. In fact, many researchers record the MMN while subjects read a book. In the ERP core, we had subjects watch this silent movie while the tones were playing. The fact that you don't need a task makes the MMN well suited for use in infants, where it's been used to study the development of phoneme discrimination. Instead of using different pitches, these studies use different phonemes, like da 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 ta da 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 ta da. The MMN is also useful in a variety of patient groups, for example, it can be used to predict which coma patients will recover. It's also widely used in schizophrenia research. Because there's no task, you don't have to worry about differential task performance as a confound. You can read more about the mismatch negativity in this chapter by Nottenen and Kriegapu in the Oxford Handbook of ERP Components.